Hi everyone, welcome back to the Blender Holt channel. Today we're going to be carrying on the lighting subject. So the first video we did was don't be afraid of lighting in Blender. And now we're going to take it a bit further in the discussion. So on that video, I got a couple of questions from people specifically about one point in that tutorial where I use emissive sphere objects as these accentuation tools to provide highlights to the Suzanne monkey head in very specific places. The question was why use an actual physical sphere that's invisible and providing emissive light rather than using a point light? Wouldn't that achieve the same thing? Yes and no, but mostly no. And it's a really big no because invisible mesh lights are like this whole tech tree of possibilities that we're going to talk about today. So first of all, let's go back to that file and just have a quick look at it. So this is the result we ended up on. And you can take a look at the video if you haven't seen it already. You don't have to, but it's there if you want to. And in here in the scene, I've got a couple of sphere objects here and they are providing light. And it's great because, you know, we can move them around and effectively decide what part of the object we want to highlight. And that's because the material on the monkey head is semi-reflective it's set up to use the light that's there if it had no reflectivity then it would be less useful for this still viable but not as good now yes you could if i just put the cursor there and make a point light then hide the sphere you could totally use a point light to achieve the same kind of thing. So there's the point light. Then if I replace it with the sphere, it doesn't look exactly the same, but you can modify the radius value to kind of increase its general size. So it would be simulating the size of the sphere by doing that. So you can get a similar effect. Yes, a point light is a substitute for that only if it's a sphere. So literally as soon as I do this, that no longer works. So for example, I can elongate the shape, maybe even select any old face here. There's quite a few faces because it's subdivided. Press O for proportional editing, press G, and then scroll to adjust and create something far more exotic like this. This very specific shape will provide light. And if I make the monkey head more reflective and make sure the sphere is selected, then what this does is it provides more complex reflections to the surface, something that lamp objects alone cannot provide. In fact, as we rotate around the object, we can see it here in solid view you can see that shape trying to be represented on the monkey head there now what this means is that for advanced light use cases if you had a very specific type of accentuation or reflection or rim highlight you can literally make a shape in 3d space to try and achieve that on the object we're going to go into more advanced use cases branching off this tech tree of light but what i figured was that since i got a couple of questions about it we're going to just carry on from the previous tutorial because then it gives you the context you can understand how these things come into play so let's say i take another section here and drag that out we can see how the reflection updates and I'll do that again. Now on a shape like this, that doesn't really have much purpose and it may be a bit silly. Why would you use an object like this for lighting when a sphere would just give something that's a relatively good substitute? That's because you have to think bigger picture here. We're gonna take a look at some of the things I've done in much more advanced scenes, but before we get there, let's substitute this for a curve. So I'm gonna remove the other sphere so now we're just left to what we had with our environmental lighting. I'm going to select Suzanne, press Shift S, and then move the cursor to her. Let's press Shift A, grab a curve. And I may have more options here because I might have enabled the extra curves add-on. But if we just make a circle, scale that down, we can see the ring there. We're going to go to the data property section where we can control the curve. We're going to go down to geometry. Then where we have the depth value, I'm going to click and hold Shift. Holding Shift just means you can do smaller values uh, to make it a bit more finer control. I'm going to make a bit of a ring here. I don't want it to be too thick. I can still see the geometry there. So I'm going to change the resolution preview value up here to something like 32. And I'll just make it a bit smoother. So we've got a ring object and now let's give it an emissive material. I'm going to press new. Again, I'm in the material properties here. I'm going to name it emissive ring. Now I'm going to widen my shader editor, go to emission and turn the strength up. Now, as I do that, without even hiding the ring, we're starting to see something quite interesting happen. Notice this highlight on Suzanne, suddenly going all the way around the contour here, all the way around the back, around the ear, up and down. And now if I select the ring, go to the object properties, and again, hide it from the camera view, when we deselect, we see that we have that highlight on Suzanne, but no ring object in the scene. So obviously that is something you can't do with lamp objects. If you go to shift a light, there is no ring lamp object. So it's exactly the same principle as the spheres we had floating around, but this time, instead of it being an actual sphere mesh, it's a much more complex shape. Now remember, because Suzanne is very reflective, the more reflective it's going to be, the more accurate the ring is going to look. So if I increase the roughness here, it's going to blur out those highlighting lines. 
Now, if I grab that ring and move it up and down, see how we get different results. And something higher up here might be pretty good, actually. We were talking in the last video about how Suzanne, aka the monkey, Suzanne is the colloquial name we have for it in the blended community, is quite a difficult object to light because though it has details that come out from its kind of average surface of the face, they're very smooth. There aren't really like harsh, easily recognizable corners to it. But a ring like this is one of those kind of shortcut ways you can pick out those details. Now, because we have this flexibility in 3D space, you can get as complex as you like. We can do like checker patterns. We can literally, I don't know whether I'll demonstrate this, maybe I will, but I could draw out a pattern on paper, scan it in, use it as a texture to surround a 3D object, pass that through the emission and use that as a light source hidden from the camera. You can get weird with it. You could make a geometry nodes tool that scatters strange shapes around the object and hide them from the camera view. And again, that will give you a level of complexity that lamp objects just can't do. What I could do is I can duplicate the ring to make a second one inside of it here. This is again, I'm just giving you some tips you can play with. That's what I wanted to do in the first one as well. Just say, hey, if you're struggling in the moment, here's a little trick you can do. So let's do a double ring setup and I'm going to increase the thickness of of the second ring a little bit just to keep them a little bit balanced and now we have a two ring layout which means that again the contours on the object are going to be slightly more complex so if i turn down the roughness you're going to see two rings fighting each other now there's a level of complexity there that will make suzanne a little bit difficult to visualize but on smoother surfaces a double ring layout actually looks pretty good and similar to how in the last video we had a point light and an area light as a kind of cheap and easy way to restrict your lighting to just two lights where we took the colored point light and rotated it around the 3D cursor pivot and said how one of these can have color while the other one provides you like this nice control fill. Likewise, maybe let's take one of these rings, make a new version of the material, call it color. And now we have one ring providing color and one ring staying white. And then we can move the rings around. Remember, these are hidden from the view. And I think it's quite easy to see how powerful that can be. And we've barely scratched the surface of this technique. So hopefully that's just answering the question for you that yes, in the case of using just a sphere, a point light will give you the right kind of approximation for that. But the concept of using a physical object for lighting in 3D space and just hiding it from the view opens up just a huge range of possibilities for you that will give you so much creative power that lamp objects alone won't provide. Now, this is the fundamental theory and concept behind a lot of my recent work. If you don't know, I've been working on a large project called Afterglow, which is a lighting product slash resource pack for Blender, which is very heavily reliant on this concept. So let's jump ahead and I'll show you how I've been using it in a more advanced setting. Okay, now don't feel daunted. We're now in one of my work files. I kind of wanted this channel to be a bit more beginner friendly than the main channel. So if you don't understand some things on the screen, don't worry about it. We've got like some complex shader setups, composition, got a little bit of Python going on down here using the asset browser with content that I've made. There's all these different thumbnails to it. In the 3D view, if I start rendering, we have a kind of strangely liminal scene here. Again, love the liminal vibe of creating spaces where no one really exists. If I go into the camera view, we have this widescreen interpretation and a sphere lit by this studio ceiling. Now this ceiling is something I've made for a whole bunch of my studio environments. And it's a general approximation of like, if you imagine LED type screens on the ceiling of a studio providing light, the light is controlled by shader nodes, like we've done with Suzanne with the sphere objects and the rings. But in this case, the nodes are far more advanced and there's mapping involved. So instead of it all being one color and one strength, we change it in accordance to an image or a noise pattern, which allows you to get any variety you like. So I can change what's on the ceiling just by modifying the nodes. And likewise, this will change what's on the sphere. So again, this is a product I have. If you're new to Blender, I don't expect you to get it, but I'm just trying to highlight to you why I'm so keen on showing you this physical method of thinking about lighting rather than a lamp based method, which I know is maybe sometimes a little bit strange because when you're going to go through Blender tutorials, particularly like a beginner Blender series for lighting, chances are someone's going to tell you about the three point lighting setup, which is we have a key light, a rim light and a fill light, or they might call it something else. That's perfectly valid. Achieving a three point lighting setup in Blender is something that's quite easy to do. And that's a pretty standard 
surefire technique. Again, like me showing you the point and the area light or the inner and an outer ring, you might set one uh, key, fill and rim and use that as like a cognitive preset that you can fall on whenever you want to achieve something that looks decent. With physical lighting, I'm giving you another tool that you can fall on. But since I just mentioned three point lighting, let me show you another structure. Okay, so I'm still in my work file, but instead of a wider studio environment, I'm now in what I call a studio cage. So this is where we're focused back on one object. And I do actually have Suzanne here as a preset so you can see what it looks like there. Again, no lamp objects involved. The light structure for this is a little bit similar to three point lighting, but in this case, it's more of a four point lighting. We have a light behind, then we have a ring light, an actual physical ring light going behind above. We have a ring light in front and elevated, and then we have a light from the top. If I show you what these look like with the lights exposed to the camera, then you can see what that structure looks like. I can show you other variations as well. I have experimented with all different kinds of combinations, and there is even more to experiment with. Again, the possibilities, as you can see, are quite endless. And I've done a lot of testing with all different variations. So it's quite an interesting one, having a light above and below, and then a couple flanking from the lower sides. So the thing here that I want to get across to you is that when it comes to lighting, there is no one right way, but there are a extremely diverse number of possibilities that are going to be appropriate or less appropriate, depending on the type of project you're doing and involving all the other considerations. So for example, doing physical based lighting like this is yes, more intense in terms of computational power. It requires a bit more time to resolve the samples. That also depends on how much lighting there is to bounce around the scene and what types of materials are involved. But it's always worth experimenting. And if you're wondering what this is, I wanted to see what glass would look like in these particular cages. And this object floating around here, which looks quite alien and strange, is my cochlea and semicircular canals of my inner ear, obtained from an MRI scan, which I turned into a 3D volumetric visualization and then into a 3D object. So we're having a little look into the future. Let's retreat back to our own blend file. So here we are back again with Suzanne and the ring lights, but let's bring it back down to earth. Let's get rid of the rings, have a look at our Suzanne again in our basic environment with just a backlighting, and maybe I'll turn one sphere on that we can use as an accentuation and just drag it around. Now that's probably enough for the video, but I wonder if it might be worth doing something strange just to end it on. I won't scan in a drawing, but I will make one quickly in Affinity. This software, by the way, is Affinity Designer. So maybe I'll just write something quickly like Hi Blender Halt. All right, a bit weird, but it'll do. Let me just grab that and tighten it up into a new file so it's all cropped. Actually, I'll leave the black out and I'll export it as a PNG. So we're keeping the transparency as well as the white. I'm going to save it where I can access it and I'll just call it Light Texture. Oh yeah, they changed how you import images now as plane. So it's Shift A Image Mesh Plane. That's how you do it. Light Texture. So now we have the plane in here and because it was white on transparent, it says hi Blender Hole. But that gives us data to use. So let's open the emission, plug it into the color instead and turn the strength up. So now the higher blender hole is producing light. Let's disable the sphere light we had. So there are no spheres around it. Maybe let's rotate the plane a bit. And then again, we can go into the object properties and hide it from the camera. So if I reduce the roughness, we can now see our text higher blender hole reflecting off of Suzanne. So we can effectively use our text as a reflective style almost. Now, what kind of situations would you use this in? Product visualization, fun VJ loop type stuff for music and stuff like that, or cars. I can imagine situations where like on the car glass, you want a logo for someone. Let's just go for a hypothetical. Maybe there's a company that likes to mod cars and they want some cool renders where they have a car, but then they have the logo for their workshop reflecting off of the window. There are all different kinds of cool applications for complex light styles like that. So it's just something I want you to keep in mind. Something you can add to your repertoire, your lighting toolbox for Blender. So hey, if you ever get any like clients in the future, you might like like to uh, experiment with something like this. In this case, now I'm just changing the color of the text on there, but you can adopt color from the image texture if it was already in there. See, so yeah, that's where we'll leave it. Thank you for sticking around. If you made it this far through the video, again, just like the first video, maybe put a monkey emoji in the comments so I can see if you did make it here. Again, you can check out my products or support me on Patreon if you like these videos. Remember to ring the notification bell when you subscribe and set it to all so you can get notified of future content. Have a great day, everyone, and I will see you next time.